Hello, everyone. It's almost lunchtime. I hope you enjoy your day so far. Is it good? <laughs> Woo! OK, so you've heard a lot today about progressive web apps, um, about the benefits they bring and the tech stack they're using. And probably a lot of you already tried your hands with progressive web apps, right? It's always fun to try a new tech with your personal project, a side gig, a demo here and there. But actually, when it comes to big business, to big commercial implementations, we sometimes get a little bit shy in implementing progressive features. And this talk is aimed exactly at overcoming this shyness. Um, I hope to give you some ideas and some procedures that you can take back to your teams, to your organizations, and really kickstart your progressive web app journeys over there. Me and my team, we recently went through a few progressive web app migrations. And by migration, I mean that we were modernizing and implementing progressive features on existing websites, the ones that already have an existing tech stack and an active audience. And from even though each of these projects was slightly different, two common things that um, I noticed were that, firstly, restructuring an existing website is much more difficult than writing anything from scratch. It can be even overwhelming. So it's really good to have some structure and some process you can stick to. And secondly, implementing progressive features is much more a question of a right mindset than anything else. Of course, knowing the ins and outs of technology does help a lot, but you really need to be in a proper zone to think in a way your users would think when they're using your app to make their, um, their experience really delightful. And these are two things I'm going to talk about today exactly. It's the process and the mindset of a progressive web app migration. So progressive web apps, as you know, focus on delivering a delightful web experience to the users. These are still web experiences, though. And very often, organizations already do have some web presence out there. This means that we as developers, we very rarely have the luxury of starting from a blank page. We rarely can or actually should start from scratch. And with existing websites and their complexities, there is no boilerplate. There are no generators, already made starter kits that can guide you in the right direction uh, from the beginning. There is an art to deciding how to tackle progressiveness in those apps. And in art, you often go with your gut feeling, right? But as the saying goes, the best improvisations are the ones that are well prepared beforehand. So it's better to be well prepared. It's good to have a structure to follow. A well-established process keeps you, your project on track, helps you enormously in keeping in touch with your stakeholders throughout the project, and also actually sometimes keeps you sane in the ups and downs of the project. In my case, the process usually looks as follows. I strongly believe that any project starts with a coffee, because no coffee means no productivity. So here we go, the project starts with a coffee. Of course, I can admit this might be a personal preference. So if you have a different thing to start, Go with that one. But anyways, after you had a coffee or whatever gives you a kick, you start with the analysis step. In this step, you look carefully at your current website and your resources to get a proper understanding of your starting point. A good analysis also gives you a very good reference point that you can compare to after the implementation is done. Next. We rarely have the luxury of implementing everything at once because our resources are limited. So you need to prioritize. And the cool thing about progressive web app tech is that it's not really a monolithic technology. It's a very modular concept. So you can often pick and choose what to implement and also in what order. Once the priorities are set, it's good to stop for a moment and prepare yourself by choosing the right tools. It's important to remember that you don't need always to write everything from scratch. You're not alone. There are tools and libraries that can help you. So don't reinvent the wheel. 
look for your proper tools um, before implementation. Then, of course, there's time to execute your plan. This is where all the fun happens. And last but not least, this is a sometimes overlooked step, measure and evaluate. It gives you both a nice summary of what you achieved throughout your project, but also a starting point for the next iteration uh, if the one is going to happen. This is a very simple timeline, but talking about it and raising the awareness about those steps uh, will make it clear from the start with your team and stakeholders uh, what the process should look like. And it will allow you to avoid some misunderstandings, some possible misunderstandings in future. So let's follow it step by step. Step one, analyze. By analyzing your website, I mean you should get the quantitative but also qualitative snapshot of your current situation. We really start from scratch, as I told you, so it is crucial to understand your standing point before you add new layers of complexity to your site. And even if you're actually starting a project from, start, uh, from scratch, you will eventually find yourself iterating over it over and over again, and each of these iterations should start with a proper analysis. And the tool that is tremendously helpful in analysing a website is, of course, the Lighthouse. If you haven't tried it yet, which I doubt, Lighthouse is a Chrome extension and a command line tool that runs over 100 audits on your site to identify how you can improve your app's performance, accessibility, and, well, overall progressiveness. In recent Chrome, it's also integrated directly into the Chrome DevTools, so you can run an audit directly in Chrome. When you run Lighthouse, you, on your website, it gives you back a report and a score that summarizes different aspects of your website for you. And this, it does not only list all the items it's checked, but also gives you proposals on how to fix them and links to further resources in case you want to learn how to actually do that. So just by running this tool, you can learn a great deal about how to make your site more progressive. Now, the very small feature in the Lighthouse uh, report that I'd like to point out is this download button. It, will, it allows you to save the generated report um, to be used for later. I found it very useful to run the report and save it for later at the beginning of my project, but also later, periodically, to observe you know, and enjoy the progress I'm making, but also to watch out for possible regressions throughout the project. So it's really nice not to only check your score, but actually save it um, in some right place uh, to use for later. Once it's downloaded, you can actually use the viewer, the Lighthouse viewer, to display it in a, in a browser tab again. And from there, you can also share it and export it to different formats, for example, PDF. And this is very useful if you want to share your report with your stakeholders that might not be you know, techie people. They might not understand how to open the DevTools. And I really encourage you to do so. Sometimes we tend to stick to the technical parts of our project and not really communicate all the ins and outs of upcoming migration with people that should be informed on the business side. And Lighthouse Report actually is a great center point that can guide you through this discussion with the business people. Of course, Lighthouse gives you a comprehensive overview of your site, but there are more tools that you can use. There's the network panel in the Chrome DevTools, the security panel that can run audits for you. There's PageSpeed Insights, web page test. And most of those tools actually allow you to save the traces from your audit and uh, a snapshot of your data so you can make use of that later. It would be good to make a habit of saving those audits at each milestone of your project. Things that you might be interested in recording are performance, of course, both load as rendering performance, resource sizes, numbers of requests, security, and the memory usage. Such audit will inform your strategy going forward, but also potentially can allow you to find some low-hanging fruit, you know, some small improvements 
that you can fix easily without much development effort, but that would lead to big gains and better overall healthiness of your website. OK, so let's say we made a proper audit of our site. We know exactly where we're standing. Now it's time to prioritize. So here's a good message to you. Progressive web app is, is not a monolithic technology. It's rather a set of concepts, and they are highly mod modular. Here you can see a concept of bringing your app offline, the concept of notifications, the concept of credential management, and so on. And for most of those items, you can tackle them independently. And you can tackle them one at a time and introduce the gains from each improvement as a progressive enhancement for your users. You don't need to go after all of them immediately, because then this can be just overwhelming and too complex on a bigger scale proje project. You can be really strategic about your choices and make it all aligned with the business need of your project, uh, rather than just tick boxing a set of rules. So how do we decide where to start? I would say start at the beginning. Before you start adding new features, you need to ensure what I personally call progressive web app readiness. I think it is worthwhile to call it out here because no amount of progressive features will solve unresponsive, cluttered, junky, or unfriendly website. So before you add new complexity to your site, you want your site to be as lean, smooth working, and optimized as reasonably po possible before you add the burden of new features. In particular, here where the audit you saved is really handy. Based on your audit outcome, you might look into the areas like the ones mentioned here. And probably these are all good old friends. Um, there's nothing new in there. But this moment when you decide you really want to invest in a PWA is a great moment to stop for a moment, check those things out, and fix them if they went off track throughout the previous life cycle of your application. The cool thing is, sometimes really small steps can bring you really big gains. And let me show you an example. Some time ago, I was working on the womentechmaker.org site. And I was doing exactly that. I was preparing it for some progressive web app features. Here you can see the network panel from before the migration happened. What I did here, I just sorted the assets by size. And just by looking at the tip of that list, it immediately gave me some, uh, some targets for optimization. Here, the two biggest requests made were for YouTube API and the hero image you see on the home page. So now, what, what would happen if we optimized those? As for the hero image, it covers the full header area, right? So it needs to be as big as the viewport, but it doesn't need to be bigger than that. So I just created a few versions of that file that um, are appropriate for a smaller viewport. I added a few breakpoints to my CSS, and with these few lines of code, bam, I got 21% less image down download on the medium-sized page. That's a huge impact for, for a single optimization like this. And this is just by optimizing a single image. And you can go much farther than that, right? Second optimization was about replacing the more complex or more demanding assets with their smaller, smaller counterparts. So here you can see on the screen two examples. First one refers to that SAD API um, file that we were downloading before. These days, it's not needed to use the API, um, YouTube API file uh, for just displaying the video on the page. You can do it equally well with iframe. And the iframe is a non-blocking way of getting this video to play on the, um, on the site. So I could just, bam, remove it entirely. And I gain 400 kilobytes this way just by you know, replacing a single line in my HTML. The second optimization, similarly, we were using Lodash library, but we're using just a few functions of it, so we could use the Lodash core instead of full Lodash. This brings us from 24 kilobytes to 4 kilobytes, which might not be that big gain like, overall, but those optimizations do add up over time. So what I try to say here is that in the, this moment where you go for progressive web app, 
it's a good moment to stop for, for, a, for a while and see if this type of um, non-optimal behavior appears on your site and fix it. The third example here is about browser caching, because once I made sure I'm not making too big resources being pushed to the user, I also want to make sure I don't push things twice, if not necessary. Actually, when I was analyzing the page in preparation for service worker, um, I realized we were doing some silly things on the page. Some assets were versioned by the version number, and some of them were actually timestamped with the timestamp. Uh, so it was kind of inconsistent. But apart from being inconsistent, it was also pure wrong, because even if the asset did not change, with each consecutive build, I would change its URL, right? Either by appending a new version number or by appending a, a timestamp. And this means that I'm not leveraging the normal browser caching that is already in built in the browsers for a long time. So it was high time to change that. And if I was not going for progressive web app, I would probably not go into trouble of investigating all that and fixing this. Each of these changes was relatively easy and very quick to implement, but it really brought a big benefit. And pay attention that this brought benefit to all of the users, not only the ones that are actually using, um, that can actually use the service worker later on down the line after the migration. OK, so let's say we are PWA ready. What do we focus on next? Well, the next thing you need to ensure is the safety. And in our context, safety means HTTPS. Many new and powerful web APIs actually take it as a requirement uh, that you serve your uh, website from a secure origin. Thanks to the HTTPS, user can trust that the site is actually you, that there is no phishing happening, there's no scammer between you and the site, right? And they know that nobody is actually listening on the interaction with your site. The web has a tremendous reach and is extremely low friction, so you get all kinds of users online, also the ones that are not very tech savvy. So keeping your users safe is hugely important in the world of PWA. Great, so now we have a decent page and a secure one. So what do we do next? Well, now is the moment where you can prioritize based on your business need. For example, if a really important thing for your business or organization is the user acquisition, maybe you should focus on perf. Because when user enters your site, you don't want to have a high bounce rate, right? You want to keep their attention, which means you need to serve them content quickly. You need to get them engaged in your site quickly um, so that they stay and they may be turn into a, a customer uh, with that visit, right? So then you focus on perf. But maybe your situation is different. Maybe you're operating in, a, in an area where you get a lot of users on a 3G connection or even lower. Or maybe your target audience usually use London Tube and they don't get connection for most of their journey. Then you should really focus on offline. You care about user retention most. That's where the kind of important part for your business is. Maybe you should focus on add to home screen feature and the notifications. This way, the app will be integrated better with users' devices, and it will be easier to bring them back and turn them into a returning customer from an occasional one. If you care about user conversion, well, maybe your bottleneck is on payments, and maybe if you try Payments API, that's where you can bring most value for your business. So as you can see, a lot of progressive web app features are modular, and you can pick and choose which ones to implement and in what order. And you should make sure to always coordinate with your stakeholders to choose the best um, line of action for your business and then iterate as necessary. Whatever you choose, though, remember to always wrap it in the good user experience. Remember that those features and technology are not the goal in themselves. Your goal is the delight of the user that is using your app, right? So it's very important on how you implement those features, and we're going to touch on that in the implementation section of our process. 
Now, it's the time to choose the right tools. Here, I wanted to give a shout out to the Workbox library. Especially if you implement offline experience, you sometimes end up writing a lot of boilerplate. And with Workbox, you can avoid a lot of that code, error-prone code, um, to smooth up your development process. But Workbox is a little bit more than that. It's also a set of generators that help you with the asset management. management. Remember that when implementing caching, this can get tricky really easily because you need to handle all the URLs and so on. So you don't really want to do it by hand. And then Workbox is really helping you out. OK, so we have Workbox. We have our priorities set. Well, now it's time to implement, right? And this is the hardest part to give any really generic advice on because each project is different. So instead, I would like to share some of the examples of the right UX patterns and the implementation decisions that you might find useful when trying to achieve this happiness and progressive feel of your website. Well, the first rule of thumb on achieving a good experience is that the user should always feel in control of what is happening in the app. And junky transitions from one view to another can successfully destroy that feeling. Of course, sometimes we do need to wait for uh, the content from the network, right? But if we, we know that the user perception of time is quite elastic as well, and we can influence it. So if we can make the user think that something loads for one second while it really loads for three seconds, this is our win. Sometimes just adding load indicators help, but you can go even farther. If the user sees that something is happening, uh, they can already start analyzing the page. So instead of blocking the transition of the page on network, you can use skeleton screens instead. Here you can see an example of progressive web app uh, for housing.com, a really well done, well done one. When you tap on a listing, you are taken immediately to the next screen where just the outline of the content is uh, presented, and then the real content is coming in. It gives you an idea, you as a user, it gives you an idea of a structure of the page you're trying to access and lets you grasp it a bit all while the real content is loading. It's a big improvement for the user, especially one as impatient as I am, usually. Another pattern that enhances this feeling of being in control is the stable load. First, what do I mean by unstable load? Well, you probably often see this um, in the web today, where you load an article or a piece of content on your mobile device, and you're reading it, and it just jumps out of, um, from under your eyes because some additional content, like an image, uh, loaded uh, at the top of it. It's especially annoying if it's a link and you just try to tap it and it always runs away. So it's really an anti-pattern. Instead, you can ensure a stable load. It's as easy as specifying the size of your images beforehand and of all the dynamic elements. And this way, you tell the browser uh, how to lay out the elements ahead of time. So the content is already in its original position uh, when the new content arrives. This way, you never miss a link and get frustrated just because of the way the content is loading. Speaking of loading performance, this can, of course, be optimized a lot with service worker and caching of the resources locally. And this is a primary reason why you should consider service worker, even if you don't expect to get audience that is fully offline. Saving some resources in the cache can make your site perform much better and be much more reliable, even if the users don't go offline fully for extended periods of time. There is one thing to consider, though. When you cache things locally, you need to be mindful of users' resources. They do still use some of the memory on the device, right? Sometimes caching entire site is simply not viable or possible. Let's go back to the Women Take Maker example. I'll show you on this example what do I mean by this. 
We went to the Maker site, it's a beautiful site, it's a rich visual experience, there's lots of imagery. If I wanted to save all of this for offline news, it would be very, very heavy. So maybe I don't need all of those images. Maybe I just save the HTML. Well, that's how the page would look like. It looks ugly, but also it's totally unusable, right? Like user can't even navigate through the page because the, the buttons are gone. So the site is unusable. How do we decide between these two extreme points? What do we cache and when? Well, I started to look at the images on that site by function. The yellow ones, I call them navigation and action. They're super important. Without them, the user can't really properly use the site. Now, the red ones are branding and priority. It's the images that me, as developer or business owner, owner really care about. Um, I use them to create connection with my audience. They're very important. They have the priority. Now, the blue ones are the opposite of the red ones. They're decorative. It's nice, they're there, I like them, but if they're missing, they don't really break the site. And now informative images are quite interesting because they look nice, but also they do convey some meaning, they do convey a message, um, so they're like semi-important. Now that I understand the structure of my images on the page, I can actually apply different strategies to those. For example, for the really important ones, the navigational ones, I just inline them with SVG. And I never ever need to even care how they're cached, because as long as my HTML is cached, uh, the image is just there in an SVG form. So that's done. Now the red ones, I care about them a lot, so I pre-cache them. As soon as the service worker is installed, I proactively go and fetch them so that when user enters the appropriate subpage, it's already ready for them to serve. I reserve those only for the priority images to not overwhelm the, the cache. Blue ones, I cache at runtime, which means when user is moving throughout my site and visiting new places, I do cache them on a you know, best default basis, and I put some limit on it as well. So this means that sometimes the image is present, sometimes it's missing, but it's not breaking the overall uh, look and feel of the site. Now, the, the informative images are quite interesting because here you can see that I can use the full power of the service worker. Service worker is just JavaScript, so you can do all kinds of magic there. Here what I wanted to do is I wanted to use an alt tag, alt um, uh, attribute, from the image to generate the, the image on the fly. I don't want to store them because they might change frequently, um, but I want to still convey the message. So in the end, I just return a generic fallback image for the image itself, and I render the text as the rest of the image, right? So it's fully rendered in the service worker, and it's never using any cache. And I still get this meaning that I wanted to convey to the user passed on. So these are four selective image strategies. And you know, depending on your site, there might be many more. So you just need to look carefully at the content of your site uh, and see uh, what's best for you. Now, let's say the user got this delightful experience from us. Uh, it's really engaged with that. So we want to keep them engaged and relaxed and looking at the screen. And when the users are using the app, they usually end up scrolling. And if they scroll long enough or fast enough, sometimes you get this scrolling glitch if the list gets too long, right? So how do we avoid that broken experience for the user? Well, you can use what we call virtualized lists. And many of the frameworks um, that are in use right now do offer this type of components. Virtualized list means that only the items that are actually in the screen are rendered, and maybe a few before and at the end. And um, all the rest is disattached and attached dy dynamically. This means that you can scroll pretty fast and never get this you know, blank screen uh, when the memory is over, uh, overflowing. As a matter of fact, it was one of the key techniques that Twitter found useful when implementing their progressive uh, web app uh, so that the users could you know, be in their tweet feed for a long time 
uh, and not get it broken. Finally, the last UX pattern I wanted to share is not to interrupt your users when they're using your service. If you ask for the permissions on load, users use, usually don't have any context about um, what you're asking them about, and they don't really uh, um, can make, they really are comfortable making this decision at that very moment. So it is much better to actually ask for this type of permission uh, in an appropriate situation. I really like what Twitter did um, in Twitter app when you go to the notification tab, so user actually expressed an interest in notification, they show this full screen overlay when the user can, um, can sign up for that. So just with this, uh, with this overlay, you can focus their user's attention also on the question being asked. Well, that's just a short list of common optimizations uh, you can look into when looking for the right UX for your progressive web app. And by all means, this is not an exhaustive list. So actually, I'm very happy to hear your stories and um, find out about the good practices you find useful in your projects later on in the lobby. Finally, everything we wanted to is implemented, and there's time to evaluate our work. Remember when I told you to save some snapshots of the data in the analysis part? Well, now they come in handy. Measuring things at the end of the project also provides business justification for next steps. So make sure you again involve your stakeholders in the whole process. You can go again through the audit and just compare the outcome uh, with the previous version. And hopefully it will give you a surge of joy as you see the metrics improve on your site. However, there is one caveat. Metrics are helpful, but they're only metrics. Getting 100 on Lighthouse feels good. I know it feels good, I've been there. And it may also help convince your boss that you're the best developer ever. But nothing is better than really checking the reaction of your users to your website. In evaluating your changes, you need to pay special attention to analytics and to the voice of your users, both to track improvements, but also to look out for a possible regressions on the way. Now you might ask, when is my website progressive enough? Is my app already a progressive web app or we're somewhere in the middle? Is it progressive when it's fully offline? Is it progressive when I checked all the boxes on the progressive web app checklist? Is it when it's 100 on Lighthouse? Well, remember that all of these are just representations of the same mental model and of the same idea uh, of delightful user experience. So maybe it's not really a question of how progressive your web app already is. You just can take it uh, one iteration at a time. Usually this process goes round and round, and you can iterate as many times as you feel you need to provide the best user experience for your needs. Thank you so much.